On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. If you don't want to be healthy, you probably shouldn't be listening to this episode. In the business world, I mean, burnout is rampant. People are stuck behind their computers on Zooms all day and not enjoying their life. And oftentimes leaders are disconnected from their people. And this is the one life we have, people. Like, and I want to teach people how to embrace it. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast, coming back to you here today. Another queen on the stage today. But what? this queen, ho, oh, oh, you might want to watch out. Dr. T, Dr. Teresa Larson in the house. T Payne, are you here? I am here. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited. You have an incredible story. And I was I was being light when I kind of like suggested that maybe they should watch out for this queen, but you have uh, an amazing background and we're going to get to it, but tell us what kind of business that you have, Dr. T. Well, I'm in the business of people and my company is called Movement RX. The problem that we solve for organizations is we help leaders dial in their health and well-being so they can show up as better human beings for their people and actually help and serve their people. Yeah, this, I mean, the health is, we're, we're in a, a very health conscious world now, I would say, as it just continues to press towards that. Even in my own life, we've just keep hitting new heights. And I love the way you're tying that to leadership and people serving people. We do the same thing with Gathering the Kings. You can't fully be king or queen and, and be winning in that area if, if health isn't important. So we're going to have lots to talk about here. Before we get to like how you help people and practically and all that fun stuff, because everybody knows health is important, but how you do it is pretty unique. I want to know you. Dr. T, you said T-Pain. Some people call you T-Pain. What's, what's the why, the deep burning thing? We're going to get to your story here in a second, but mm -hmm. the thing that's burning on the inside that makes you want to do this, even after all the success that you've had, what is that? Well, I, life is now, not someday. And with, in my life, I've lost a lot of people. Both my parents are gone. I, I've lost colleagues uh, when I was in the Marines. And, you know, I have two little boys, an amazing husband. And often I, I found myself in the past always looking to the future. Like when this happens, I will feel this way. When I get this form of success, I will feel this way. And it's just not true. And I've found that when I'm in the precious present and really embrace my life and the people that are around me, I'm happier. And I want to give that away to people because you never know, right? Like yeah. my, my dad was gone like that. My mom, it was years of suffering from breast cancer. And you just never know how much time you have on this earth. And so I live in the now with the end in mind. So I don't hold back telling people I love them or forgiving myself or forgiving others or letting go. Like, because it, it will wreak havoc on your life if you don't let go. Yeah. And so I want to give that gift to people. And in the, in the, the business world, I mean, burnout is rampant. People are stuck behind their computers on Zooms all day and not enjoying their life. And oftentimes leaders are disconnected from their people. Yeah. And this is the one life we have, people. Like, and I want to teach people how to embrace it. That's what I do is live in the now embrace and own your life and leaders give your people the permission to do that and you do that too i mean that's just a huge i mean we could just like take the podcast down in tonality and talk in these really deep principles of everything that you just laid is heavy but it's real mm -hmm. but you've tied that feeling of live in the now and presence to the physical body and, and so I want to get to how you, how you've done that, but then also how you help other people. But, but we can't skip over the fact that you just said that you were part of the Marines. First off, thank you for your service. My family's indebted to you. Everybody listening here today is indebted to you, but tell us about that portion of your journey just for yeah. a quick second. Cause that's a big part of what shows up today in front of us. Yeah. So I joined the Marine Corps. So I was an ROTC. I went to Villanova university and played softball there, but I was also an ROTC. So biceps are called vicious and delicious. Those, I was a softball player. So, I mean, can't get it. And that was that those, those terms for my arms were coined in the Marine Corps too. So okay, <laughs> it didn't it. happen in college, but 
it was just me protecting a friend of mine at a bar, you know, in Carlsbad, California. Anyway, I joined the Marine Corps after college as a second lieutenant. So I was commissioned and, you know, went through all the training and then became an engineer. So out of all of my fellow lieutenants at the basic school, TBS, if you're listening and you're a Marine, you know what the basic school is. And they decided, the Marine Corps decided to make me an engineer, much to my family's dismay, because <laughs> I wanted to be public affairs, you know, writing letter, like writing articles and recording things. But now I was front lines <laughs> with demolition. And so my job, you know, I kind of joke about it now. It's like my job was to blow things up for a living. And now I just blow your minds on human performance and uh, people. Wow. But the, yeah, so for four years, well, just shy of four years, I served as a, sec a second lieutenant and first lieutenant and did operations like in, in country. So in, in the United States, building things, building bridges, building Jersey, you know, building fences, things like that to help the infrastructure. So we worked in Texas, we worked in Bridgeport. And then the other, I did deploy to Iraq. So went to oh. Fallujah. And that's where I did more landmine clearing. I did, I was a female insurgent escort. So meaning like when the Delta Force or, or Navy SEALs would pick up an insurgency cell, terrorist cell, and there was a woman involved, I would be asked, because I'm six foot one and I'm very intimidating. And so it seemed like on Camp Fluge, I was the most intimidating female Marine. Woo! Awesome. Great job. I know. I know. So, I said, watch out. Uh, yeah. You know, and so they would, the regimental commander would bring me in to escort that woman back to her people because, you know, wars break out over holding women, you know, and, and, and so women, unfortunately, in the Iraqi culture were more, pro not products, but they, they weren't really seen as human beings, right? right. Like they were property. And so yeah. that was that was very sad to see. And not all aspects of Iraq are like that, but in this certain region it was. And so that was one of my jobs, but in Iraq it was a convoy. I was a convoy commander. So I would go and build vehicle checkpoints, work with the army to, you know, we we were part of the first Iraqi election, which was pretty cool, where we ran an all night mission setting up Jersey barriers at different polling sites. And yeah, so I had a wonderful platoon. The woman in my platoon, there was a few. I had about 54, 55 Marines. Few of them were women. And in Iraq, we had them be part of vehicle checkpoints where, you know, when people would be filtered through vehicle checkpoints, if they were pedestrians, they would have to search the women that were crossing through just to make sure they didn't have any explosive devices on them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then I, you know, led different missions around Fallujah and yeah. Did a lot of, you know, Incredible. sleeping in different areas and in unique um, spots. And and dealing with unique circumstances. I mean, yeah. figuring out where to go to the bathroom, you know, or yeah. having to like literally go to the bathroom in a bag and then put it in the fire, which now burn pits, you know, are a big issue. Oh, have been a big issue, but now thankfully legislatively, they're taking care of Marines who've been ex as any service member who've been exposed to burn pits. But who knew, right? Like we were around burn pits all the time in theater and they are extremely toxic. Yeah. But as a young lieutenant, I, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about taking care of my Marines. Yeah. And so that was part of my job. I, you know, on the internal side though, for me, I, while I was at war, really, literally, I was also at war with myself. I had a significant mental health condition called bulimia and was hiding it for quite a long time Wow! because I, I just didn't want to think of it as a legit issue. You know, you don't get in trouble or pulled over for an eating disorder, but right. it was something that was growing inside me. It was how I handled stress, how I coped. And as a young woman, you know, I lost my mom when I was 10 and was here in this extremely stressful situation thinking, oh, it's just going to go away. It's just yeah. a weird eating issue. And no, it didn't. And so all the while I was like doing the, this work, no one knew, right? And, and here I was fighting this internal battle and eventually I asked for help. And that was the hardest thing I've done, but also the best thing I've ever done. I mean, you've, you've given us plenty to, to take from let's, let's just parlay right into what you just said there, as far as that decision for you 
because I see that so much like asking for help really with anything. For you, it was an eating disorder. I'm sure for your clients now, it's it's health, you know, or or getting to a place where they can be, you know, physically fit or or even mentally based on physical. But there's so many things in business that are the same thing. It's like, you know, I'm not telling anybody about the growing debt or the fact that I'm not going to make payroll in two weeks and I don't have anybody to talk to, which is often why a group like Gathering the Kings exists anyway, is to be able to reach out. But in that moment, it was like you were compressed, I bet. Tell us about like, okay, so it's like the, the hardest moment, but then it switches over to where you actually ask for help. Talk to us about that moment. What were you thinking? What were you feeling? What made well, you? Well, yeah, it's a really good, good thing to ask. As you can imagine, I was 24 years old. Right. And I'd been a highly competitive athlete, one of the best in my the Big East, right, as a pitcher. And I'm not, you know, here to not bragging. It's just like, like I was driven yeah. to be the best and I had to be the best. That is how I gained self-esteem and attention. Yeah. I, I mean, once my mother and I'll and I'll share yeah. this because there might be listeners who are experiencing this. Once my mother passed, things changed considerably for me. I have two older brothers. I was raised by my dad. It's like, okay, survival. I'm in survival mode and I have to be the best because that's how guys say, pay attention to me. That's how coaches pay attention to me. That's how I'm going to get into school. And that's how I'm going to be a winner. And I even like, I would read books growing up about performance. And I remember reading a quote saying, society only sees winners. And so I was like, that, and that was at a really impressionable age for me. And I was like, that stuck with me to this day. I'm 42. And I still like, Society only sees winners. And so I had to be a winner. And I remember, and so that's the way I was. Like I was more fearful of failure yeah. than asking for help. Like it was like I, I couldn't fail my team. I had to be the best. And you can imagine like the highs and lows of, I mean, we played 80 games a year in softball. And as a pitcher, you get a lot of attention, whether you win or lose. And so it was like this roller coaster of emotions I would go through, depression. Highs, lows. Yeah. I mean, probably could feel like I was bipolar sometimes because it was just like highs and lows, highs and lows all the time. Yeah. And if that was what bi you know bipolar, I know is you feel these tense highs and lows. And so going into the Marine Corps was like another level of intensity. Oh yeah. And so I mean, now I've got lives at stake, and I wanted to go in because I was like, this is the most rad service. I wanted to make a difference as a woman set the physical standard, right? Do the 20 pull-ups, run my three miles in less than 18 minutes. I wanted to set a standard yeah. and be the best. And so I could not show weakness. And weakness to me was admitting you have a problem, Yep. Could not doing 20 pull-ups, right? Like not being in front of your Marines all the time and leading them, yeah. crushing their souls in the gym or <laughs> running. Like that was, that, that, that was... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, again, that's what leadership looks like there. That's what I felt like leadership was. It's but it also, to me at that age, was giving the Marines what they needed to be the best they could be. So yeah. not only was it me holding myself to this standard, but also giving them, taking care of them. And so essentially it was putting my performance and everyone else, for, else first. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there were Marines, I mean, these are people like the moment I checked into my unit, Marines have marital issues. You know, I have like 18 year olds marrying women, men twice their age, right? With multiple children, like thinking about, okay, we're, we're, I would like turned into a marriage counselor, yeah. right? Too. And here I had all these things, responsibilities. Yeah. And so then, so fast forward to Iraq, and here I am in theater. Um, intensity is now even more. So you, college intensity. Then I go into the Marine Corps, a little bit more, a lot more intensity, preparing for deployment, right? I was already struggling with the eating disorder before I deployed, um, but I wouldn't want to tell anybody. I didn't want to admit it was an eating disorder. Actually, I didn't really believe it was, but looking yeah. back, yes, it was. But it was all about mission accomplishment. It was like, who cares about me? What, what yeah. I care about is the mission of my people. I got to sure. take care of them. That's what I signed up for. And so then going into going into theater, it was like that stress just escalated even more. I mean, now we're dealing with getting, you know, fighting back and real world, like 
you can die. Like this is, we're in a situation where you can die today, tomorrow. And I had a whole group of Marines that I had to make deci- help make decisions with and take care of. And so here I am, very lonely, you know, because again, like I live in, well, not again, I live in the barracks with my Marines. Like as an officer, I had my own quarters, but like, I can't go and hang out with them, right? I'm a, I'm a woman, like I'm not going to go hang out with them because, right, right I care about what people think. Yep. Right? At the time I cared a lot, like. I don't want to be observed as too friendly. Right. Right. And then my fellow Marine, other guy, other guys I worked with couldn't hang out with them either. So right. I was, I felt very alone. Yeah. And, but here I am. So in my room struggling. And then once I get out of my room, put on the, the mask and do my job. But the people I could talk to were my father. And then I had a boyfriend who was in another part of Iraq. Right. He was a pilot at the time and worked in a different part of Iraq. So sometimes we talk on a satellite phone, but it was mostly my father that I spoke to. And my father, I'll set the stage for this. My father was a Catholic priest. So he decided to become a second vocation Catholic priest later in life. So he lost his wife, my mom. Right. And he could do that. And he went into the seminary for four years, did that. And so here he is like, you know, talking to me from his church. I was telling him all this stuff that was going on with me yeah. and, and he was relaying all of this to his parishioners. He's like, thanks dad. You don't have to tell people when you're on the pulpit that about my issues, but he would. He was using them for, it was good, good material. Yeah. My dad I was like, thanks dad. Appreciate it. But I remember him saying like to me, Teresa, like I've already lost your mom. Like I, yeah. it would crush me to lose you. Like do something to help yourself. And he wrote, he never told me exactly what to do, right? But he wrote me a letter to, you know, telling me like, you're on a roller coaster. Like you need to get help. The Marine Corps will go on, but you won't Mm -hmm. if you continue like this. Because I would, when I called him, I would just cry and cry because I felt so alone. And it was after, so kind of after one of our conversations and reading one of his letters, I come home from a convoy and I went into my captain's office and said, I need help, sir. Struggling. And the first thing he said was, oh, my girlfriend in college had, you know, something like that. Like, well, yeah, this is not college and I'm not your girlfriend. I need legit yeah, help. Yeah. I'm here. It, I'm actually putting myself out there. Help me. Yeah. And so I really had to fight to get help because all of the, the men that, you know, I had to ask help for were like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, go yeah. talk weakness. to a counselor. You know, you know, and I like literally they looked at me like it, it was it was it still can hurt to this day, but I don't blame them. Right. They don't they didn't have the skills yeah. to handle this, yeah. but it was literally I had to fight to get the help I needed. And so I ended up coming home, medevac home, which was one of the hardest journeys, too, because here I am right with this condition I knew was holding me back like. If you think about cognitive accessibility too, when you're in a, yeah. in a war zone, you want to be at a hundred percent. Yeah. And you were and not. I was not, I was probably at 30 or 40%. All I could think about was the next time I would, you know, try to hurt myself or, you know, whatever it was restricting, right. you know, and this might be triggering for some people. So know that, but like purging, when was the next time that was kind of my hit, right? You think of alcohol or drugs. It's like, the, the eating disorder, the food was my hit and yeah. food everywhere. And so that was how I coped and I needed help because cognitively I knew I wasn't there hundred percent for my Marines. And so asking for help was the hardest journey because I mean, the Marine Corps, they, they now are better with handling situations like I, people that experience things like me, because it's actually more common. It, it's very, oh, yeah. Common. Yeah. but that's people hide it because of how I was treated. Yeah. Right. And I mean, people looked at me like, what the F is wrong with you? Yeah. What? You can't go out to eat? Like, what do you have a hard time going to the buffet or eating brownies? No. Right. Even society will, will, there's a stereotype. It's like only rich white females, right. Experience this kind of stuff or celebrities. And okay. Maybe people observe me like that, but I wasn't, I'm not that. Yeah. And even if I was, it could happen to anyone mm-hmm. and but it is a disease. So that asking for help, you know, that was a catalyst for 
oh man, I, I know I'm not alone. And this is, this is a component of leadership, actually. I was being a leader by asking for help. Even though everyone made me feel, some of my colleagues did not. You know, I had other yeah. great leader friends who were like, no, Teresa, that is a great, you know, you just flexed a part of leadership by asking for help. That's right. But a lot of people aren't going to see that in a way. But it was a very hard journey because the Marine Corps is a very male dominated kind of 10 years behind the times in the way they handle, you know, yeah. the people. people. Hey, kings and queens, Chaz Wolf. I want to talk to you about something that's super important to me. We put a lot of time and effort, we meaning myself and my team, into this podcast, into the content that goes out every single day. And if you have been getting any sort of value or insight from this, we want it to be able to reach other business owners too. So we would love if you would like, comment, share, leave a review, post, share again, <laughs> all of the things on social media, on all the different platforms or even on the podcast mediums of Apple and Spotify. We would love to be able to get our content into more hands, more entrepreneurs, so they can grow their business as quick as possible. Together, we are building a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who are committed to growing their businesses to new heights. So let's do this. Let's help each other. Let's help each other grow. And uh, it's there. Yeah. You said it at the beginning that, that you're in the people business, and and obviously that's just the differentiator. There, There's the story you you've just done a beautiful job here of of connecting your personal history with this you know eating disorder but with with how entrepreneurs are dealing with their lives and so the people that are listening right now they may or may not be dealing with the specific thing that you're talking about that you needed help for but it's the same story and so number one i appreciate you sharing well first off i appreciate you going and getting help like 100% that was absolutely a strong uh, flex of not only just servitude towards yourself but then also then to other people and maybe some of those other people are the ones that are listening now or some of the other stages that you speak on but for the entrepreneurs listening right now it's the same story it's we're between our ears we don't have anybody to talk to when we ask for help it seems like it's a weakness we're supposed to be the ones that have it all together we're the ones with employees we're the ones with the families we're the ones impacting our communities and so it's you set the stage beautifully and and it comes down to this place of it feels like the end and I need to get help and it feels like the end, but it actually, you, you hinted that it was the beginning. Yeah. And so keep, keep giving us a little bit of the story of how that was the beginning. Kind of weave in here your business stuff as well, because I know that that came eventually later, but this, this place where someone might be sitting right now listening to you going, you know, I need help in my business, my marriage, my wh whatever's going on in your life. Yeah. And you just can't keep going the way that you're going, but it re requires what, you know, Dr. T did as far as asking for help, but then it, there's a process of getting the help, getting around other people, pressing into certain things. Continue to tell us your story. Yeah. So thank you. And now when I teach, when I speak on stages and work, you know, speak to business leaders, it's obviously, it comes out like much easier, right? I didn't know all these things at the time. Like you're not going to feel like it and motivation comes after action. I didn't know all those things. But what I did know was that I had to face my shame, right? I had to work through the shame and, and I put myself, so I put myself in the position to ask for help and I set myself up for people shaming me mm -hmm. and shaming myself. Yet I knew deep down that okay, I mattered to my father. I mattered to other people in my life and something was wrong and something needed to change. And so it was a catalyst for, okay, I got to figure this out. Like, what does Teresa want yeah. versus what does everyone else want from me? Because for a while it was like, well, I want to be the best in the Big East because that's cool and people are going to notice me. And yeah, it felt good. And there was a lot of ego. Mm -hmm. And even in the Marine Corps, I had to be the best doing pull-ups and running. And, and because, well, that's how Marines respect me. One way, right? It wasn't the only way, but was it one way? And... I, but yeah, but was that what Teresa wanted? You know, what does Teresa want? What is, what drives Teresa to get up in the morning? And well, it actually wasn't what I was doing, how I was living. And so the, the, the asking for help was a catalyst for getting to know Teresa. What is, what drives Teresa? What wakes her up? And by facing the shame from my colleagues and, you know, fellow officers and just 
people in general, society making comments, right? Like it was myself, I, I, I was able to figure it out over time, but it was time. Like it's not, it's a process, not a pill. Yeah, and good. now it's a blink of an eye kind of time when I look back, but at the time it felt like forever, yeah. you know, it took a year and a half of going through intense therapy. And then I still go to therapy because I believe in it. And it's kind of flexing that mental muscle of, yeah. you know, you know, keeping myself healthy, right? I, I go to the, I work out for my body and mind, but I also talk to someone yeah. for my body and mind. It's important. And so the, the asking for help was, a you know, the, the journey kind of catalyst of change, but through taking action, working through my shame, relearning, you know, realizing what Teresa wanted, which Teresa wanted to to, you know, work with people and help people, help them understand life is now. And, you know, I think through therapy, I don't think it happened right away that I realized that, but it was like, I love helping people. I mean, I'm like my father. He loves helping people and serving people. And I'm good at connecting with people and getting to he the aspects of humanity that matter versus superficial BS. And I knew that was a gift of mine. And so how could I do that with people? And I was always fascinated with medicine because my mom struggled with, you know, breast cancer from an early age. I mean, she passed when I was 10. And I remember sitting in her oncologist's office saying, asking all these questions like, you know, when, how long does my mommy have? And what does this mean? And I want to be part of her radiation therapy. And I wanted to watch everything. Yeah. And my grades went to crap during the, that time. But who cares? And I was there for my mom and, but that always fascinated me. And so I thought, okay, well, what's next for me is serving people and helping people understand their condition. I want people to understand what's going on with them. So they don't feel scared. Right. I give them the answers they deserve versus withholding answers. So then I decided, yeah. all right, I'm going to become a PT. Now, physical therapy in general isn't for me, but what I know is and so very quickly after going through PT school, I had a, another WTF moment and was like, well, I'm starting my own thing because this isn't working for me and this isn't how I want to serve people. That's right. So hence Movement RX was born. So it was, it was you know, the, the asking for help started to help me get to know myself. And that's a journey, a constant journey. If any of you ever think you've arrived at knowing yourself, you're wrong. Yep. You're always evolving. But I was like, at least it got me going in the direction of what does Teresa want? What does Teresa need? What, how does she want to serve people? And I knew I wanted to help serve people in tapping into their humanity, asking for help if they need it, and understanding that they can change and their life can be amazing right now if they choose to face their shame and, and grow. And so it's kind of funny, like I have a DPT, right? A doctor of PT and a strength coach and all this stuff. Yet. I help people like take ownership of their life right now. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm really not in the day-to-day -day of like manual therapy. I mean, when people call me T-Pain when I was working on them, they're like, you're so strong <laughs> and you're so like, you make yeah. us hard. And I'm like, well, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and those things, I mean, I think that you, the practical day-to-day -day, you're talking about in the actual PT, these are the functions that you're doing. Maybe you're not there with them, but. Uh, I think that everything that you've just shared actually leads up to exactly what it is that they need today to be the better leader, to be the better uh, you know, person for themselves. The, the, the last connection here, and I want to get into how you actually work inside your business and, and help folks, mm -hmm. but the, the journey that you just described was this, you know, I was alone, I had a problem, it took a long time, but I asked for help. I got around people that cared for me, that were able to help me. I was able to strengthen myself as well as others around me. But then once you even hit a place where maybe you were recovered, I still heard you say that it took personal work on your side and you continued to be around other people. And then the third element was I heard you say that you now started giving back. And when I think about a business mind or you know, becoming a king or a queen, it's the same thing, right? It's like we're growing a business or we're growing our lives and there's a struggle. There's a, you know, it's a warrior mode and, and pressing into hard things. And a lot of those things almost kill us, you know, sometimes literally, and, and you yeah. press through those things and you got to get around other people and you got to get around people that care for you and, and it strengthens you. But even when you get to that place, when you're strong, it's like, you don't, 
You don't leave the things that just worked. You don't quit yeah. doing them. In fact, you do them more. And then you help others because that's really the mature outpouring is like, now I get to help other people. So that's just led you to a place where, you know, someone listening right now may, may not turn in themselves into a coach or into, you know, someone that does their business for other people. They might just continue to help other, you know, people in their community, or maybe they just, you know, they help in their family and in their church. Like there's different ways to pour out. For you, it turned into an actual business where you get to help people doing this very same thing. So tell us about that, because it's not just like you're working individually. I know you've done that in the past, but you work big corporations. You're helping leaders across executive boards. Like, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So here's the thing. Like, you can lead and be healthy at the same time. Right. I learned that it doesn't have to be one or the other. And it it does. It is a pretty common thing to for leaders, self-identified or running companies, whatever, to feel like they have to choose between work, family, health. Right. And it's usually two of those three things. And but it doesn't have to be that way. And so I think for me, you know, my business, I'll, I'll just give you a little inside of the trajectory. It started as a PT business. Like I was I was running like private, like mobile clinics in CrossFit gyms across San Diego. And then I had a big clinic in downtown San Diego. And but and then I was also teaching for CrossFit. I was teaching the movement and mobility course with Kelly Starrett across the globe, like traveling all over. It was awesome. Yet I wasn't teaching my stuff, which was something I didn't like. You know, I found very quickly, I was like, I'm teaching someone else's stuff, which was cool. Cool, right? Yeah. But even though I'd, I'd recovered, I was in recovery with my eating disorder, I still found myself struggling when I first started my business of, well, I'm supposed to be doing PT work. And at least I started my own cash pay business, which was growing and I hired people. And I was traveling across the globe as a new PT, teaching to like, you know, hundreds of coaches and health providers. But I still was like, mm, this isn't actually the way I want to serve people. Mm-hmm. But I had to still, I, but I didn't know that, right? I think a really important part of, you know, the, especially the growth mindset, we got to have a growth mindset of like, well, I tried it, been there, done that, didn't like it. Okay. Like, I didn't know. Move on. I didn't know that right, traditional PT wasn't for me. Yeah. You know, I didn't know teaching someone else's coursework in a really cool environment wasn't for me, but I did it and I did really good at it. And then, but I knew that I wasn't, but it was, but it was affecting my health too. And that was, you know, paying attention to how I was feeling, how my body was doing, my sleep, all the things like I knew that something was off. So then I started to look at doing more virtual work. So I started to, because some of these coaches I'd worked with across the globe were like, can you do programming for us? And we'd love you to work with our company. I was like, okay. So I started to create virtual programs. And I started to do in-person corporate wellness in San Diego, which wasn't super scalable, you know. And so then I was like, well, this kind of stinks because now I'm like exhausted and I've got a team, but they're, you know, it's still exhausting. I didn't want to do it. And so again, and I, and all the while I was, you know, I've been in flowing with my self-care. So yes, I was in recovery with my eating disorder, but when stress hit the fan, like I would fall off sleeping well in my meditation and eating well. And, 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 and so I started to see a therapist and, but this wasn't any normal therapist. And this normal, this therapist was a brain researcher, biofeedback, mindfulness, meditation coach, like say that 20 times, you know? Yeah. There's a lot. Very fast. But he taught me how to relax and he didn't like dive into my past or he knew my story, but he wasn't like, you know, gosh, we got to talk about your youth. And he was like, well, how are you sleeping? Are you meditating? How are you eating? You know, who are you connecting with and what are you paying attention to? And so he's like, Teresa, you are the principal in your life. If you're going to, you have to work for your business and your family and everything else to work. Right. And I was trying to get pregnant at the time too, around this time. It was around 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'd already been three years into my business and traveling the world. And I was still not happy with the trajectory of my business. Yeah. And I could feel it viscerally. And it was on my mind all the time. And, and so I was like, okay, I need to change, shift the course of my business. And I really wanted to work with leaders, like, like myself. I'm a leader. I wanted to work with leaders. And I saw there was a disconnect, a gap in the leadership training space. Corporate wellness, right? We end oftentimes get pushed into like ex- employee assistance program spaces or HR. Right. That has a lot on their plate. God bless them, right? They have a lot to do. 
And oftentimes being innovative with well-being programs isn't what's on the top of mind, right? It's other things. And so I was like, in leadership, a lot of the leadership training is a little outdated. And, you know, some of the tr- wellness pieces are like, get up 4.30 and crush your soul kind of type stuff. You know, and, and that's not relatable to a lot of people. And so I was like, all right, so I met an individual on LinkedIn. He's a retired Navy SEAL commander. I found myself always working with special operations guys because I just, I don't know. Like you know I, how they think. I, yeah. And they're, they're a little weird, which I'm a little weird. I, I'm proud to say it. I just, you know, I think outside the box, it's okay to be, yeah. you know, feel a little, I mean, we're all a little different. That's let's right. Just, let's just face it. Yeah. Anyway, this guy was a mindfulness-based meditation coach as a retired Navy SEAL. And I was like, that's pretty rad. Okay. Not, not what you'd think. Yeah. And so we teamed up. And started to do leadership training around mindfulness and movement. And so that is what we do, I do now is we both have our own speaking business, if you will. And we work with organizations together on leadership trainings around dialing in your well-being. And we've had a lot of success with big companies, small companies. My company, Movement Arcs, we work with the VA, the Veteran Administration. We work with the CDC. We worked with Amazon. We worked with Nike. We worked with all kinds of organizations, smaller, yeah. big. We work with HMI, which is a company out of North Carolina. Anyway, point is, is when what we do is we help leaders dial in their well-being and how they show up. So, you know, if you think about how you're sleeping, right? If you don't sleep seven hours a night, you're, cogn- you're going to cognitively decline quickly, right? And, and think about lifespan. Like if you don't sleep well, it's going to affect your aging. And going to affect your lifespan, but it also affects your emotional reactivity. It increases your emotional reactivity when you don't sleep seven hours, right? If you're eating inflammatory foods or just eating mindlessly, right? At, at lunch, you know, a common thing is people work and eat. Well, you're not being mindful, right? If you're not training your monkey mind, right? Just like I think of training your bicep at the gym, yeah. right? If you're working out, how are you training your mind to be present? Yeah. Right? It takes time, right? I'm, I could be having a conversation with you, but not physically or mentally here. Well, I'm physically here, but not mentally here. Yeah. But I want to be present to my children. I have two little boys. I want to be present to my husband. Yeah. It doesn't just happen overnight. Like you have to train your mind and meditation and mindfulness is the way to do that. And, and then of course, movement. There's planned and unplanned movement. I don't like exercise, really. I mean, I used to ab- abuse it, but I do it because I know it's good for me up here. Uh-huh. I know it increases my creativity. And oh, by the way, the unplanned movement, right, is actually the most important. How much are we moving during the day? I'm I'm squeezing my butt right now, right? I'm squeezing it. (laughs) I'm moving around. You're probably like, what are you doing? I'm actually trying to avoid the the light coming (laughs) from aspen trees. If I could just show you what I'm looking at outside, it would be great. Too beautiful. Um, But the but the unplanned movement, right? We got to get eight to twelve thousand steps in a day. Are you doing that? Yes or no? And so the you know, and then of course, who are you hanging out with? Who are you talking to? What are you paying attention to? Yeah. Right? What's going in and out? Cell phones are, you know, it's turned off for me. It's on grayscale. I don't want to be interested in my phone because there are other things to be interested in. I guarantee you a lot of us listening are wasting your life on your phone. Yeah. Distracted. And if that's what you're paying attention to, think of what you're paying attention to on there, but also who are you talking to? Who are you listening to? Who are you hanging out with? You are, you actually become the five people you hang out with and talk to. Yeah. Mine are my little boys and my husband, and then, you know, a couple other individuals, but. <laughs> That's okay. I think there's uh, some admiration there. Yeah. But it's, I mean, those are things like those impact how you show up. You as a leader impact your people's health and well being because guess what? They spend a lot of time with you in your That's company right. That's right. That's right. and also at home. So guaranteed, they're talking about you at home at the dinner table. What do you want them to say about you? Yeah. You know, and and so I found that when I look back, it's like, yeah, the Marines I worked for, the officers, they affected my mental health. The guy I worked for in CrossFit affected my mental health. You know, and I've actually been able to go back and tell these people, like, guess what? My mental health wasn't great working with you. And and I wasn't blaming them. I was just, I just want you to know that you affect your people. Yeah. And that's what I do now. And I, and, and I, I, I appreciate the growth 
I had working with you, but I want you to know you did impact me this way. Yeah. And maybe, well, think, maybe you can be more aware now. Yeah. I think that, that leadership is obviously, uh, you know, as time has gone on and, and humanity has changed, even in the last 50 years, a hundred years, there's dramatic changes. Our, our, what we consider normal life is just different. And so leadership obviously has changed, but what you're talking about are the ability to be aware, some call it EQ, some call it awareness, but just the ability to be outside of yourself and to then not only just be outside of yourself and be aware of the room, but to read the room or even just to imagine the other person, how they're, how they're experiencing the room. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people say how they're feeling, but that may or may not be applicable in the moment. What their feelings are might be associated to something completely different than the room. It was still you need to be aware of. It's more of their experience. How are they experiencing the room? And then as a leader, then how am I, how am I guiding the energy of the room? How am I guiding the, the, the discipline of the room? How am I guiding the room? <laughs> am I even leading the people in the room? You know? right. And so I think there's just a lot of great questions that are out there for leaders today that are in this topic. And you've given us some really practical things, you know, maybe on the soft skill side of like, no, like it, it matters. Knowing, knowing my people's personality matters. A hundred years ago, that wasn't even a thing. So knowing, knowing their, their mental state, knowing what they're, what's going on in their family, knowing the, like all yeah. of these things just have become so much more important because how they are individually is how they're going to show up to work. And same thing for the leader. Obviously you're helping the leader to the impacts them, but I'm kind of just pressing the issue here for the person leading that has other people that they're leading. It's like, no, it's actually a really big deal what Dr. T is talking to. Uh, you about right now because it, it matters like your influence on them you know is possibly yeah. going to be the only major influence on them and then their then their family you know what i mean yeah like how do you ask yourself like how do you want to impact your people right and if you're like i don't know well then dig, dig into that why right. are you like that you know it's it's you i mean i really I think having kids really opened my eyes. To, I have a three-year-old and a, a six-year-old, Magnus and Axel. They're giant little boys, awesome, right? And they're like, they're, they're amazing. And they're teaching me all the time. Like, how do I want to show up for them? They mimic me. And so it is a great mirror of like how I show up. And you know what? I'm not always that happy. <laughs> like every morning when we wake up, I do med meditation. Sometimes my little boys join me. So it turns into like a kid's meditation. Yeah. But I, if I'm sad, I will tell them, you know, mommy is sad and here's why, you know, or if I get mad at them about something that's probably dumb, you know, and overreact, which I do because I'm human and we all do. I'm like, I messed up. I'm quick to say that versus cover it up or, you know, blame it on them or whatever. It's like, those are really great skills. And now, you know, they are very, I, I find that they're building empathy. They share with me their feelings and why, you know, and, and that's really powerful. And then my team, I, I instill that in my team. I don't just start business meetings with, hey, let's get right down to business. Okay, tell me what's going on here. Tell me what's going on there. Like, right. give it to me. I'm like, hey, so what's the positives of the week? You know, hey, what do y'all need support with? Yeah. You know, sometimes we'll start with a meditation. Anytime I run a group, I, I start with, Okay, share with me, you know, green, yellow, red. Where are you at? Green is focus, yellow. And I don't judge them for it. Everyone's got different things coming up in their life. And, you know, then we ground ourselves with a meditation. And it's a meditation. Maybe it's a body scan. Like learn just breathing deeply and relaxing our bodies. I literally did this with a bunch of sheriffs in Colorado Springs two days ago. Literally got all of them doing a body scan. Yeah. And um, it was great. And we had a lot of fun. And then we also blew up balloons to learn how to breathe. And, you know, there's lots of different fun ways to, to improve our well-being. Yeah. And all I tell people, it seems overwhelming because you can look, you, some of you listening might be like, well, there's just so many places. I actually put together something for this show. It's the Lifestyle Rx that we can, we can provide at the end, but it, it'll give you a framework of how to dial in your sleep, how to dial in your food, your social support your mindset and your movement, just some things you want to think about along with some video drills, videos I created uh, with drills on it, drills. Yeah. Anyway, the, the, but the point is, is like one thing at a time, you think about getting 1% better a day there. Right. And, and where do you want to start? What's the magic wand? Like if you had a magic wand, where would it be? Maybe it's sleep. 
Okay, so start there. Sure. Right? Yep. Think about this as a lifestyle. Like it's not a quick fix. Over the course of the year, you can right. dial in each of those five components of well-being. Yep. Not all at once, but one at a time. Right. Dial in sleep for the next few months. Then dial in food. Then dial in movement. It doesn't have to be all at once. Yeah, I'm going to connect what you're saying to, you know, probably 98% of entrepreneurs and we're either all in or we're all out. And so when you right. say one at a time, it's like, uh, like, I understand that, but that's not how I operate. You know, I'm, I'm either all in or I'm all out. And so this revelation that you've just shared, I want to just back it up for the listener that it actually is super important because it can't, we can't just have it all at once. We can't just have a great marriage, a great body, a, a great business, be everything that we want to be all the time. And so what happens is that we think that we can, you can have it. It's just, not all at once, like Dr. T is telling you. And so because we go after it all at the same time, we don't get it. And so then therefore we kind of just throw up our hands. We quit. We say, yeah, it, it's a fallacy. I need work-life balance, like all this stuff that doesn't actually exist. What's real is what Dr. T has given to you. You dial in. That's what she said. She said, dial in your eating, dial in your mind, dial in your marriage, dial in your time with your kids, dial in your business, what your yeah. team, the, the, all of the things and yes, there's a lot of things. Okay, fine. Welcome to entrepreneurship. Welcome to leading other people. Right. <laughs> That's what you signed Absolutely. up for. That's what kingship is, right? That's what queenship is. So, so in, in all of this, Dr. T, what I'm hearing you say is you can have it. In fact, actually, it's what we call the exceptional life. When I am winning in all of these areas, we call them the, the dimensions of kingship. When I'm, I'm winning in my business, when I'm winning in my marriage, when I'm winning in with you know, my, my health, when I'm winning in my faith or my lifestyle or you know, all the different areas of life, like it's only until when you're winning in all of them that you have all of it or the exceptional life. And it seems far off and not many people get it. This right here, Dr. T is giving you the exact formula. It's today, I'm going to work on this one thing. And then I'm going to do that long enough until I, it's like, oh, I don't need to work on it anymore. It's just part of me. Cool. Next. Yes, right? exactly. And the think about it. So for those that are kind of tactical thinkers or like numbers, if you dial in one thing, right? Like let's say, you get up early and you start doing a mindfulness practice or meditation. M meditation helps you improve your mindfulness, which is this level of awareness, mm -hmm. right? So that's, I can pray, I can breathe, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. But you take some time in the morning to just decrease your anxiety through some breath work and focus, training your mind. Well, doing that one thing, getting up 15 minutes early, right, is a, is a skill. So you get up 15 minutes early, you do it. And then when your kids wake up, giving myself as an example, you're less reactive. And then when you get to work, you feel a little bit more present, right? Less reactive. So what does that do? What's the, there's, there's a domino effect that's going to happen during your day by doing that. But then exponentially over the course of a year, you're going to become 37 times better by doing that one thing every day right. by, by getting 1% better. Or you could get 37 times worse. You could become worse too by, or you could just, I use this quote a lot. If you do what you always done, you're going to get what you always got. You could do that too and not change, right? And stay the same. But I, I, you got to be brutally honest with yourself of where you're at, that, which is why I created that Lifestyler X is like, it's a yes or no. Are you getting eight to 12,000 steps? Yes or no. Are you meditating 10 minutes a day or praying 10 minutes a day? Yes or no. You know, if you're doing five, it's a no, right? Like, are you sleeping seven hours or more? Yes or no. Obviously, there's a quality of sleep there, but yeah. that's, you know, that's something too. to dig into over time. Yeah. So, but yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. We don't have to be all or nothing. And it is, there's no such thing as work-life balance. And there's always, it's a, you're always a work in progress. There's never an arrival. Right. That is also something I have to remind myself all the time, just like working on my well-being is a constant. Okay, of course I want there to be an arrival, but this is the journey I'm on. Every day I have life, I wake up, and how do I want to face my day? Yeah. And how do I want to impact people? And oh, by the way, who cares what Joe Schmo is doing next door online? Like, what do I want? Yeah. And these things, like, if you don't want to be healthy, you probably shouldn't be listening to this episode. You know, I tell people, you probably should just walk out of my talk right now if you don't want to yeah. like yep. help improve your life. Permission to leave. Yeah, you have permission to leave because you're not going to like what I'm saying. Yep. But like, look, like, how do you want to show up? And these life skills 
you know, do impact us. Like we, as we, as we get older, like there's just more and more responsibility and demands and it can feel like a lot. Believe me, I get overwhelmed sometimes and I have to sit with it. Like that's part of the mindfulness practices. All right, I'm just overwhelmed right now. It's going to go away. You know, it, it, you know, things will ebb and flow. My kids are sick and I've got this going on or I've got this going on and okay, well, it's okay. It's just right now practicing equanimity. But here's the thing. The problem that I see with entrepreneurs and business owners is like, you want to do it all at once. You want to get it now. And then you fall off like these. And you just start, you just kind of fall into your rut of, all right, work, then family, work, and then family. And your health goes, goes down the hill. But the consistency, how do you stay consistent? No diet, right? No crazy exercise plan is going to fix you. Like you have to figure out what's going to be sustainable in your life. I love, I used to work for CrossFit and I hated doing it. Sorry, all the CrossFitters out there at the time when I worked in it. And now I love it, right? I do it two times a week. I haven't drank in the Kool-Aid. I just do it because I love the community and I can go, I live in a mountain town now. So I'm like, yeah, you know, clearly I'm, I'm in, I'm in the attic in a beautiful attic, you know, overlooking the Aspens talking to you across the country. It's great. I get quiet in isolation here, which is what I need. And then I can go into town and train and I got a pull up bar outside my house. I built with my, tr- you know, my TRX gear. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm giving myself that, but I know that's sustainable for me right. versus oh, I got to work out six days a week, one hour because David Goggins respect the guy trains three hours a day and meditates three hours. I got to do that. No, you're not going to, that's, that's not sustainable yeah. for you. Maybe that's yeah. not. And I have all the respect for guys, that, but you're you. So yeah. meditation for me is 10 minutes a day. Right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe other people do an hour. Okay. So what? Yeah. 10 yeah. minutes is fine too. Three yeah. minutes is fine sometimes, but I'd like you to do 10, you know, or, and so that's the thing is like, how do you stay consistent? And if for those of you that need to dial on these health and well-being behaviors, one at a time. Right. You're you're eating. Maybe you're eating scrap. OK, well, so what? Get get your sleep dialed in. That will help improve actually your food. Like there's a lot of that's the beautiful thing about this that I love is like people dial in one thing and then they realize, oh, you know what? I've been eating better. I feel yep. better. You know, I'm, I'm better to my kids. This other thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it just like, you know, it helps Dominant. your life. That's right. And so just know that and you are OK exactly where you are. That is. One of the other things I think is really important that I, I would like to give this, you know, gift to for my dad is meeting people where they're at. Like, I'm not going to shame you for where you're at. You know, if you're overweight, you're struggling, you know, you maybe you're making seven, eight, nine figures too. Great. But are you healthy? Because at the end of the day, that's a part of your wealth. And you can't enjoy it if your knee's always hurting or you're overweight. And, you know, what's it all for? When's it enough? Yeah. Like, make sure this is you, you can lead and be healthy at the same time. It yeah. doesn't have to be one or the other. I agree with you 100%. And I think that people like you are waking people up to that it's possible for, for all of it. I, I've got one question for you. And <clears throat> this is how I end every show. And so I, I'm, I'm just with your experience, I'm just like, ooh, I can't wait for your answer here. But if you had a chance to whisper, go back in time and whisper in the younger Teresa's ear. Little Teresa, not Dr. T, not T Pain. Yeah. What would you tell her? Well, I actually, it's a great question. I, man, but it's going to make me cry. It's, I would tell her she's amazing just the way she is. I just, I would tell her she's loved. She's beautiful just the way she is, whether she performs well or not on the ball field in school. And I actually, have a letter I've written to my younger self. I'm going to keep really? it next to my desk. So if you don't mind, I can read it. Of course. Yeah. Oh. And this, this younger self is to the young Marine, but the young Marine who was super impressionable and who wanted to be the best and struggled internally. And it wow. was, so I'll, I'll read this to you. Yeah. Okay. Dear Lieutenant Hornick. And this was actually a great exercise for me to help learn to forgive myself. Oh, I bet. So, dear Lieutenant Hornick, my, my maiden name was Hornick. Yeah. Thank you for reaching out for help. It took a lot of courage. 
I want you to know that when I asked for help, it was the best thing I could have done for me in my life as a human being and as a leader. And it also was the hardest thing I ever did. Pride, shame, comparison, and exhaustion all can get in the way of taking ownership of our well-being if we let it. I learned over time it was okay to put yourself first so you can show up as the best version of yourself each day. Yet the reality of the reality, especially for hard chargers like yourself, is you wait until things are really bad or you're really sick to do something about it. I have been there. Caring for yourself so you can enjoy the beautiful life you have now for, with the, and the long game in life, longevity, is a set of skills that will truly add life to your years and years to your life. You can lead and be healthy. The irony of your situation, Lieutenant Hornick, is while you're at war, the most deadly war is within you. So this quote was shared with me by an old friend. I hope it sinks in with you. It takes the courage and strength of a warrior to ask for help. Your older self. Wow. And I'm proud of you. Yeah, I like that last little piece. Wow. I'm sure that the treasure chest of Dr. T could keep going and going, but thank you for sharing that. That was, I haven't, I haven't written a, a letter to my younger self, but I've thought about this. Obviously I've asked this question hundreds of times now, just the impact of what it could be. Of course we could always, you know, think about it, never can turn back time, but the, what I love about what you said there, and I just want to point this out for the listener. I don't think we've ever actually had this opportunity to kind of perspective, you know, make, give this perspective is yeah, we can think about going back and maybe changing time, although that, that can't happen. And so we kind of just find resolution in like, well, it is what it is. But what you just said was that the older self, the you now was actually able to heal or to move forward in a completely different way because she did go back and whisper in the younger Teresa's ear yeah. and not necessarily in order to change the time, but so that the current Dr. T could move forward. Yes. And so there's a lot of power in that. And I want, I want the listeners to be able to connect with you because obviously there's a lot that you can offer in that as well as obviously just physical health. And there might be corporations listening right now that where they need to bring yeah. you in and do some sort of a, a event or, or speaking opportunity for you to be able mm -hmm. to help leaders across the world. How can they find you? So you can find me on LinkedIn. That's the, my social media platform of choice, Dr. Teresa Larson, DPT on there. And I, am, I do presentations, trainings for corporations, conferences. I love speaking, but I also love the impact of the products and services I provide companies, which is the human connection experiences. I actually call them the competitive advantage trainings because you dial in your well-being, it's competitive advantage. It is. Um, so that's a great way to re reach out to me. My email, you can obviously reach out to me via email too, which is Teresa, my first name dot my last name, Teresa.Larson at movement-rx.com. My company is movementrx.com. And I have a link that I'll provide you that people can download that Lifestyle Rx. Yeah. It's got some great information on it. What I'd suggest is print it out, put it on behind your computer. And then do some of the videos you're going to, yeah. we have, I have, if you have a lacrosse ball or a tennis ball, I've got self massage techniques on there. You can see me doing all kinds of weird things and it's fun and you'll start to feel better by dialing in these things. So that's how you can get in contact with me. I'd start love to work to dial with you. it in and, and get a hold of T pain, Dr. T herself. Yeah. You've been incredible. You have an incredible story. Thank you again for your service to the country, but, but even in addition to that service to yourself, to your family to the queens out there and also just the, the whole kingdom of people trying to be great leaders. I appreciate you giving here today. I wish you nothing but blessing to your family and all of your endeavors here this year. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Jazz. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1000 Kings specifically who are grateful, but not done. 
were intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.